Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. You are, of course, listening to a podcast at this very moment, and there's a lot of podcasts out there in the world, you might have noticed, doing very different things, different kinds of approaches, different kinds of subject matter. Here is something common to all of the podcasts that I know about. They are produced by human beings. There are no non-human animals that have their own podcasts, at least not without help from regular old human beings. There's something special about human beings, something that makes us different from other animals. And I say that with great caution because, of course, there's an enormous amount that is common between human beings and other animals. And you have to say other animals because we are animals. We are part of that heritage. We share enormous amounts of DNA and functionality with other animals, especially the great apes, the, our closest genetic relatives. But also, we are different in some ways. So I think it's easy to overemphasize either the similarities or the differences. There's a spectrum, but we're at one end of the spectrum. And so rather than just saying we're the same or we're different, the interesting thing is to see exactly how we are and compare it to exactly how other animals are and tease out both the similarities and the differences. So one of the leading researchers in this area is Michael Tomasello, today's guest. He is a psychologist, probably, if you had to pick something, that's what you would call him. But if you look at his academic appointments at Duke, where he is located, he's in the psychology and neuroscience department also in the evolutionary anthropology department, and also in the philosophy department. So he is spanning these different areas. And one of the great things about Michael's work is that it's very empirical. He's doing experiments, and he's doing experiments comparatively between great apes and human beings, especially young human beings you might expect to have the most in common with our primate relatives. And he has a theory. He has lots of theories. He has lots of ideas that uh, he's exploring, but he cares about what makes human beings different. And he puts his finger on our sociability, our ability to have social interactions of a particular kind. I mean, you remember we talked to Adam Bully very recently, and, and he and his collaborators have this idea that our ability to imagine the future and do mental time travel is crucial to what makes humans different. And I think that that absolutely is a plausible theory. But then what are the ways in which we become different? And so Michael Tomasello wants to say it's how we interact with each other. Of course, other animals also interact and have social webs in which they move. But there is something about human beings that enables cooperation, morality, obligation in ways that seems to be special. His new book is called The Evolution of Agency, From Lizards to Humans. And uh, he points out right in the podcast that the word lizards is very intentional there in the title because usually his research does not involve lizards, doesn't go back that far. But there is some idea that agency, the idea of a person being able to act for reasons uh, has evolved over a very, very long time. And that's part of what makes us special, the, that sort of intersection and interplay between individuality and the group dynamic and how we come together. So lots of good stuff from one of the leading thinkers out there. Let's go. Michael Tomasello, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Yeah, hi, Sean. Thank you. One of the things I love about your work is that you're interested in the differences between human beings and other great apes, uh, and therefore you study both. You study you know, children in development and also apes. And so tell us a little bit about the, the methodology of doing those things. I presume it's very different. Uh, and are you ever like very surprised by similarities or differences that you find? Well, I think one of the reasons that people find uh, the work interesting is because um, we're always thinking about how we're similar to animals and how we're different. The, the ancient Greeks already thought like that. And I know from talking to non-academic friends and stuff, people find it interesting. What do chimps do that's similar to us? What do they do that's different? So I think it's kind of inherently interesting. So that's um, <clears throat> that makes it a little bit easy or to sell. Um, so in terms of methodology, it sort of started out um, 
where um, we would do a study with kids and we'd say, well, let's try it with chimps also. And they would be two different studies. And mm. um, we started with gestural communication and we looked at chimps for things that looked like kids' gestures, like maybe like pointing or something like that. And then, you know, I don't know exactly where the idea came from, but I said, well, let's just, you know, put them in exactly the same situation as much as that's possible and see what happens. And uh, <laughs> we used a, we used a metaphor at that point. Uh, let's turn up the microscope, uh, you know, meaning uh, from the beginning, make them as similar as possible. Um, and I knew from the beginning that there's a whole contingent of people out there who really don't like saying how <laughs> great apes are different from humans. They want, they want to stress how similar we are. Mm -hmm. I'm an evolutionist. I take similarity for granted. I take right. continuity for granted. We're only six million years separated from them. Ten fingers, ten toes. I mean, you know, uh, uh, we perceive the world the same way, uh, um, you know, interact with one another in lots of similar ways. So I take similarity for granted, continuity for granted. But people don't want to see any differences at all. And <laughs> my, my colleagues like Franz Duwall and Christoph Bosch, who are always uh, stressing similarities, I say, OK, if you don't like my story, please, um, you know, tell me uh, a better story about what makes humans different. And, you know, I mean, we have basically won the large mammal competition. All the other large mammals are under our control. Uh, we can wipe them out or keep them alive as we please. So there must be something going on. Um, and all I can ever get out of them is language. Hmm. But I have a whole book trying to show that language presupposes a lot of social cognitive things, a lot of theory of mindy kind of things, a lot of cooperative. We share information with one another cooperatively in a way that other apes don't. We, I, I tell you stuff for your benefit. Mm -hmm. I share stuff with you just to share it, just gossiping and whatnot. So there are different social cognitive mechanisms, different motivations underlying language that are much deeper. And that's where I get to the shared intentionality business and language is an outgrowth of that. So anyway, the whole point of going off on that little tangent was to say um, that those people, I knew they would criticize the experiments for not having exactly the same uh, methods because they can't be exactly the same. Yeah. All right. And so um, we did every time we designed one of those studies, we uh, did our very best uh, to make them the same. And then in addition, we had control conditions. And this is really important because some of the uh, I mean, control conditions are, you know, a basic part of science uh, from introductory class on scientific methods. But um, uh Christoph Bosch in particular, who's not an experimentalist, but is a field worker, uh, has never appreciated, that, for example, people say, well, you know, there's a human experimenter and that matches the um, species of the children and it's a different species for the chimps. But we might do a study where, um, where we, um, you know, like if we're, <clears throat> we're going to um, hide some food from the chimps. And we kind of, you know, maybe lift it up a little bit or we do something and then they find it. But then we point to it. This is one of the places where they surprisingly fail. <laughs> and we point to it like this and they don't find it. Well, the human <laughs> experimenter was the same in both the control condition and the experimental condition. So if it was going to affect it, it would affect them in both. So um, and then on top of it, children find it. Uh, that particular task is just as an example. They find it quite trivially easy mm -hmm. from infancy. So, so this is what I call a good negative, because <laughs> as, as we know in science, negative findings, meaning a non-finding, no, mm -hmm. not different from chance, could be due to anything. And uh, so um, you you don't know. But what I call a good negative is that the chimps pass a control condition that's very similar to the experimental condition that's only a little bit different. And kids in the same, as close to the identical methodology as possible, they pass. And that to me um, sets uh, the, the chimp failure in the key condition in a, um, in, in a, in a um, it makes it a meaningful uh, right. fact that it's meaningful that they don't do it. 
So you asked me about the methodology. So I was just saying we try to make it as similar as possible. Uh, but, um, of course it's not identical, but then we try to take care of that with control conditions and, and we see if, uh, human children can do the same thing. We did have France to on the podcast and it is uh, fascinating research, but I, I take the point. We're always slightly amazed when we find, uh, other primates showing empathy or altruism or something like that, that we think about as quintessentially human. And we emphasize the similarity there, but in some sense, there is something obviously different. There are no chimpanzees who have podcasts or who use laptop computers. So there's clearly a question to be addressed here, right? Uh, every species, by definition, every species is unique in some way. Yeah. Right. So we're not we're not saying anything. <laughs> and humans would seem obviously, you know, we have skyscrapers and podcasts and computers and. Uh, language and uh, social institutions uh, and universities and governments and mathematics. And so, you know, we are clearly what makes us different is clearly some kind of cognitive thing. Uh, but at the same time, part of my shtick has been um, that uh, the, the, the really unique cognitive part is intimately bound up with the unique social part that right. that, that what we do is. Uh, put our heads together with others. And I've, from my very earliest things, I've used the um, uh, the thought experiment of the child on a desert island who um, uh, grows up without any other human beings mm -hmm. uh, from birth with no other human beings. You know, what mathematics would they invent? I feel <laughs> like they would do pretty much what chimps would do, right? So chimps can already quantify things and tell which one has more and things like that. Uh, what would what would you invent on your own beyond that? Well, sir, you know, maybe little, I don't know what, but certainly not algebra. Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, and would you invent a language by yourself? That makes no sense. There's nobody to talk to. You, <laughs> you wouldn't invent a language by yourself. And you certainly wouldn't invent a social institution or any of this complexity by yourself. So this is the key diagnostic feature is that humans are not doing this on based on individual brain power. Mm. They are adapted to leverage, to use that metaphor, to, you know, uh, what other people know and, and collaborating with others and communicating with others and socially learning from others. And of course, culture is built up to actually teach others. And so that's really uh, the difference. So um, uh, if you, if, you know, if you raised a chimp on a desert island and a kid on a desert island, <laughs> they wouldn't end up that different, but uh, humans are adapted. But then you raise a chimp in a human culture, which people have done mm -hmm. in various ways and they maybe are you know uh, are a little bit different but they're pretty much still chimps and and kids in a culture are you know uh, doing all these um human-like things so so clearly there is so i mean let's just let's just get the claim very very clear um other great apes which means i guess what chimps orangutans and gorillas is that right uh, and bonobos. And bonobos, right. So <laughs> they have some kind of social skills, but you're saying that there is a special kind of social skill, and we'll fill in the details, but there is something special uh, about how human beings interact with each other that does differentiate them from these other great apes. Very, very good. Yes, precisely. And clearly there has to be something biological there also, because like you say, you can't bring the chimp into a house and raise it and it'll just be human. That's correct. So good. So our, our quest is, is clearly defined how we want to figure out. Exactly uh, and you, if you is. want another indication of the biological part of it is you have children with autism is the is the syndrome. Mm -hmm. they, they tend to be missing exactly the things that um, um, uh, that I'm trying that I'm zeroing in on. Right. Of course, autism is very complicated because it is a spectrum and you get people Correct. who are very in it. So that that but it, it is a good thing to point out that we can uh, that, that you know, ultimately there are both the differences and we're both suffused with commonalities and that's okay. We want to get exactly the nuances right. That's correct. So, okay then. Um, you know, I've often, in my simplistic physicist way, been asked, you know, is it possible that human beings would ever be able to understand the ultimate laws of physics? And I have a line for that, but you're the right person to ask whether my line is at all right, which is that we did undergo some kind of phase transition in human cognition where we can manipulate symbols. And I almost want to say it's like going from a primitive computer to a Turing machine where we've reached a level of abstraction where 
yeah, I, I don't see any obstacles to us figuring out everything eventually. I mean, nature has to cooperate, but there's a different kind of cognition going on at the symbolic manipulation level in human beings than in other apes. I agree with that, but I would say that your child on a desert island, uh, uh, they're not going to learn a language, right? Mm -hmm. uh, they, there is no language to learn. Uh, there's nobody to communicate with. Are they going to be symbol, symbol manipulators like that? Right. <laughs> so, okay. so, so the brain has evolved to do all of that in interaction with others. Uh, that, that's, uh, uh, and I think, um, uh, you know, getting other people's uh, other people disagreeing with you and you having to take their perspective leads us to one of the things that I think is taken for granted in much of adult cognitive science is that we can look at an object and say, you know, that's a dog, that's an animal. It's a thing. It's a pet. No problem. Call it whatever you, you know, whatever's appropriate. Well, I don't think other creatures really have that kind of flexibility, mm. that the same exact item can be looked at from different points of view. And we all know from a certain age, children know, uh, maybe little children don't, really little ones, but from a certain age, we know oh, it's just a matter of how you look at it. So we have all this flexibility. Um, I've even talked about perspectival cognitive representations. And I think symbolic, the way you're thinking about it and the way a lot of people are thinking about it is of that nature. When you mean symbolic, you mean a symbol for animal or a single symbol for dog or a symbol for pet. And uh, it's not about the world. <laughs> it's about <laughs> our conceptualization of the world. And then we can manipulate those in all kinds of ways. So um, I think the evolution of the species was to be able to do this in interaction with others. And then I actually start my book on the evolution of human thinking uh, with a metaphor. I say, um, it seems like thinking is something in the privacy of your own mind. And it, and it is, but it's like a jazz musician playing a jazz rift in his apartment by himself uh, yes, he's doing it by himself, <laughs> but it's he learned jazz from other people, right. and the instrument was built by other people over many years, perfected, and he's and he's playing in the genre that was invented by other people before him. So, um, so yes, we end up doing all this thinking and and uh, and symbol manipulation. Uh, but if you look at the evolutionary and cultural history, um, uh, the individual is growing up and being assimilated into that. And that's an essential part of the process also. So you mentioned that around 6 million years ago is when we diverged uh, Homo sapiens. Well, I guess genus Homo, should I say? from uh, Genus Homo, yes. Yeah, correct. from the other great apes. Uh, what can we well, say? Well, actually, it wasn't genus Homo. Sorry, I, I, I correct that. Uh, it, that's when hominins, that's hominins. the line leading to humans, started. Uh, but it's only about two to three million years ago that we want to call them Homo. So they were Australopithecines and things back at six million years ago. I, I knew there was a very small chance I was going to get that right. Thank you for, for getting yeah. it right. So yeah. so what do we what can we confidently say then about where in this evolutionary trajectory this little transition happened? Do we know? Well, we know that, what that, uh, uh, um, it's a fascinating question. And in that. All right, so let's take the six million years. Yeah. From what we can tell from the fossil record, for the first four million years, or some people might say more like three or three and a half, but somewhere uh, more than half, uh, we were basically bipedal apes. Mm -hmm. All right, we were four four feet tall, four and a half feet tall. Our brains were the size of apes, and we just happened to walk on the two legs. But there was nothing that seemed to be different at all. Then two two and a half million years ago, you start getting these stone tools. But they're not very sophisticated, right? And chimps already use stones to crack open nuts. They don't fashion the stones, but they know how to use stones. Yep. Um, and so you start getting something new. And then two million years ago, you start getting a little brain growth. It looks like a little bump uh, there, and you're getting this tool use stuff. So it's two million years. I think you can sort of zero in on part of it. But if you take this uh, social cultural hypothesis seriously, um, uh, and you look at the tools, uh, it's really less than a million years ago uh, that you get something that looks like uh, collaborative uh, foraging, collaborative hunting, for example, which I think was a key transition point. And so that's less than a million years ago, perhaps even a half a million years ago, if you if you're very if you don't allow group scavenging and stuff like that. Um, 
and uh, and then so that's half a million years ago, and then maybe a hundred to two hundred thousand years ago, very recently, that's Homo sapiens sapiens, and there's where you get the idea of really cultural groups and where different groups have different tools, and hmm. uh, that's the time where you might expect to see the, um, a conventional language and things like that. So uh, the answer to your question is, when did it happen? Is I'm of the view that it was fairly late. Yeah. And uh, out of the six million years humans have been on their own trajectory, in the last million, um, uh, where something really different happened. And 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 I, f- I forgot to mention that there was also a, another brain growth spurt around a half a million years ago. So. Okay. I mean, it does seem like a really hard but important question to say something like. The idea you already mentioned the idea of a theory of mind, the idea yeah. that human individuals not only know things but know what other people know or have opinions about it. Is it even contemplatable to imagine saying, oh, th- this point in evolutionary history is when we developed a theory of mind? <laughs> uh, well, you know, it doesn't leave fossils, so yeah. no, we, we don't. <laughs> but, um, uh, uh, but chimps already know some things. I mean, I I, I try to avoid the word theory of mind just because people mean different things by it. But, you know, one of our one of our most highly cited studies, the one that really kind of changed my mind, I I originally started out thinking chimps didn't understand any mental or psychological states of others. Mm. But then we did a study where um, a subordinate chimp and 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 a dominant chimp are competing for food. And the subordinate chimp can see some food that the dominant can't see it's on the subordinate side of a barrier right okay and the subordinate behaves in ways that show she knows the dominant can't see it right (laughs) right. but this is just seeing this is not sharing thoughts or disagreeing with opinions all right but uh, we also have studies showing that they understand what others goals are so if they watch somebody else uh, trying to reach a goal and they're not able to reach the goal they still know what they were trying to do even though they didn't see them do it all right. So so um, they have this is sort of ground zero that I think the great apes uh, all share is an understanding of the perception and goals of other individuals and not the mental states more narrowly defined. Um, so there's already a starting point of that. And then that's why I say, uh, you know, continuity, it's continuity, but it, continuity doesn't mean identity. Um and uh, and so I think that what starts making the difference is when it's important to me, like if we're collaborating, it's important to me that we're both looking at the antelope over there, but you're seeing it from one side and I'm seeing it from another. And you have one strategy and I have another strategy and we've got to coordinate those. And so one of the things that I've argued in, in with children is th- this hypothesis that I have about putting your heads together it's uh, a necessary feature is something like a theory of mind, but a, it, to be sufficient, it needs to be coordinating with other right. people's minds. And that's in communication. That's what, right. When we're having a conversation, we're trying to, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't understand you. You have to revise yourself. You say something, I disagree with you. We're coordinating our minds as we're communicating. And when we're collaborating, we're coordinating not only our actions, but often our decisions uh, do, do you know in the um, in game theory coordination problems? I do, but the audience might not. So, <laughs> so a, a coordination problem is is a problem where um, we need to do the same thing. Let's say we're at a we're at a, a a rock concert and it gets out and we and we get lost from one another and we need to go home together. You know where are we where are we going to meet? Well, we. I think, well, okay, where, where does he think I'm going to go? <laughs> well, he thinks I'm going to go where I think he's going to go. Yeah. And he thinks I'm going to go where he thinks I'm going to go. So these coordination problems um, uh, require coordinating and recursively thinking about what he's thinking about what I'm thinking. Um, and I think what we've called joint attention, which you see in young infants already at about a year old, um, where we're looking at something together. And then the infant looks up at you and then looks down and and we're coordinating our attention Mm. to this object. Um, I believe it has a recursive structure that Mm. not only am I looking at it, I know you're looking at it and and I know that you know I'm looking at it and you you know that I know you know (laughs) I'm looking at it. So uh, the sharing attention and sharing intentions uh, and sharing mental states is about this kind of what 
to get away from all the recursive embedding, we just say common ground. We have common ground knowledge. We both know that we both know. And I don't think chimps and other primates have that. And I think you once you get that, so you again, you're talking about humans as symbol manipulators and uh, and and re- reaching a phase transition with a no way uh, with a new way of thinking, I believe it evolved to coordinate your thinking with others, hmm. right? And with this taking perspectives, um, you know, and um, and um, and trying to make what you're thinking perspicuous for your partner. Um, one of the things people have asked me couldn't couldn't um, humans have evolved all this fancy theory of mind? Uh, including recursive thinking in order to compete with others. Mm. So I'm wondering what he thinks I'm going to do and what, right? couldn't it be competing? And in theory, it could be. But the thing about cooperating is I want you to read my mind. <laughs> if, we're, if we're cooperating, <laughs> yeah. I'm trying to make it, if you and I are going to go do something together, I try to tell you, Sean, here's what I'm thinking. Here's my plan. What do you think? Right. And oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I changed. I'm going to do something else. So I am trying to facilitate you reading my mind. So I think um, and, and of course, a lot of the communication we engage in, uh, I'm just informing you of things. I'm just telling you things uh, that I think will be helpful to you. And especially if we're collaborating. Oh, you dropped your spear over there or something like that. Um uh, uh, again, I'm trying to make it easier for us to read one another's mind and for us to collaborate uh, uh, together uh, on a common goal. And you can see why people would think of language as being so important here. I mean, if you want to communicate to someone else what is in your mind, something pretty intangible from the outside world, the ability to use language is very helpful there. And So you're not denying the importance of language. You're just saying that it flows out of this common uh, social skill. Absolutely. And, and again, the book that, um, that I wrote on the evolution of all this, um, on the evolution of human, human communication, I say there's actually a halfway point that shows you that it's about um, – that it's not language as a conventional symbol system. Uh, uh, that's not the first step. We have gestures that are uniquely human. For example, pointing and iconic gestures or pantomime. Mm. All right? Uh, so if I if, if 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 you and I are whatever wandering around out in the woods and I point like this, okay, what do I mean? Well, you have, you have no idea with no context. But let's say you know you and I are decided we're going to go hunt antelopes, and we both know from our past experience, we know in our common ground that we need a spear and we need a wood of a certain type to make a spear, and we're wandering around and I point over there and you see a piece of wood like that, okay. You can understand that I'm I'm pointing out that piece of wood to you because it'll make a good spear right. for us to do collaborate together. A chimp cannot communicate in that way. Hmm. Pointing is basically you gloss pointing as look over there and you'll know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> okay? right? right. And and with the same pointing, I can point over there and mean there's some berries, there's some delicious berries. I can mean anything with the pointing, but it depends on our common ground. It depends on what we know in common. Uh, when you search your search space, like what does he mean when he's pointing over there? It has to be things that we know in common. I wouldn't be, I couldn't be pointing about something I don't know about, and I wouldn't likely be pointing about something that I knew you didn't know about. So, it's things that we both know about. So, so that's a kind of a halfway house to language is, and, and iconic gestures are symbolic, right? So I say, you know, let's go. I, I make a. I make a, a, um, a gesture like uh, throwing a spear to say, let's go hunting antelopes where we throw spears. No, other apes do not use yeah. iconic gestures either. And they're symbolic already. So I'm absolutely, I started my career in developmental psychology with on language. So I am, I am the last person to say that language is not important. Uh, but um, uh Language is the icing on the cake. It's the jet rocket at the end. All right? It's not the starting point. And in fact, there are actually theoretical in principle arguments that you can't start from nothing and just say, oh, OK, let's call that a tree. <laughs> like, uh, uh, you, have to, you have to have some some I think you have to have another form of communication and then you conventionalize it into a language. And now you've got these conventional symbols and so forth. So anyway, so, yes, I think language is is critically important for 
um, uh, for uh, many uniquely human uh, things. And that's why our child on the desert island, one of the main reasons that he or she wouldn't get to fully um, adult human uh, cognitive capacities is because they don't have language. But it presupposes a lot of other things. And if you want to say what makes humans different is language, then you've got to go back and mm. account for those other things that make it possible. And where would you stand on the question of whether or not there is an innate language capacity, uh, sort of Noam Chomsky, Stephen Pinker point of view? Um, I, I wrote a, a, um, a, crit, a, a critique. Of, I wrote a bunch of critiques of it, but but uh, uh, um, one, uh, um, Pinker's book, The Language Instinct, which was uh, such a sensation. I, I just said, really, if you want to really understand, you have to be a little more precise. He's really saying a generative grammar mm -hmm. instinct. He's saying Chomsky's theory is an instinct, and that's what I disagree with. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, of course, we are biologically um, prepared, biologically evolved to use a language. There's no question. But I believe we're evolved. We're evolved to have certain co cognitive capacities to form concepts, uh, to communicate. Like, for example, with pointing and pantomiming, which is not linguistic. Mm -hmm. So that form of communicative intentions and reading people's communicative intentions and recursive thinking and all that. So we're prepared in all those ways. We're prepared to understand other, to imitate other people when they use a piece of language. We're, we're, we're prepared to internalize the language and use it in our own individual thinking. But Chomsky's proposal was about generative grammar. grammar it was about yeah. syntax. Yeah. <laughs> all right. And, I my the institute I was at in Leipzig, Germany for many years, uh, we had a linguistics department that was focused on cross linguistic studies. And um, uh, yes, there are a lot of commonalities in the languages of the world with regard to, again, the use of concepts and communicative intentions and certain principles of uh, pragmatics of communication and certain principles, but the actual grammatical structures are quite different <laughs> in yeah. different languages. Uh, so I actually think that's um, um, that's the least likely thing to be innate. <laughs> good uh, out of all the aspects of language. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. I mean, I, I loved language instinct, but I, I do take your critique pretty well. Pretty it, it's, it's a great book. A great There's book. no, you know, you can you can um, you can disagree with yeah. something, and it's a uh, he was. Uh, um, he made language interesting to the general educated public in a way that nobody really ever had before. So he, um, it was, it's a great achievement, that book. Uh, but I, uh, uh, and if you, and if you, and if you just softened it up and in a few places, uh, <laughs> uh, and got away from the Chomsky and thing and talked about language more generally, um, 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 you know, there's a lot of it that, to, that I could agree with. And I guess the other thing that is very similar to that question is, the distinctions between what you're trying to talk about and what we normally think of as evolutionary psychology, because yeah. you're both an evolutionist and a psychologist, but you you diverge a little bit from the the party line in evolutionary psychology, if I'm not wrong. Um, okay, so sometimes people call it evolutionary psychology with a capital E and a capital P. <laughs> and I've also called it I've heard it called high church uh, uh, evolutionary psychology. When I started my department in uh, at the at the institute in Leipzig, I thought of the name evolutionary psychology, but it was already taken yeah. by a very particular view. So what people call evolutionary psychology, I am an evolutionary psychologist by by the any normal meaning of those terms. Um, but um, the Tubian Cosmetes version of it has some special um, uh, characteristics, and from the beginning, they you know they. They started in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where Chomsky is, and uh, they have um, this. Chomsky was about language as a module, and it's innate and it's modular, and so they took this idea of innate and modular, and um, and you know tried to see everything in through those lenses and. Uh, I just find it a little bit narrow. I, it's, I don't. I don't find it wrong. A lot of their stuff is really fascinating and really um, uh, interesting. But um, uh, you know, when they focus on th when you focus on something like mate choice, mm -hmm. okay, I'm all in. Okay, <laughs> there's something that's really um, evolutionarily important. Obviously, is who you mate with. Um, and uh, who you find attractive and who you mate with and all that can easily be a little specialized module. I don't have any problem with that. 
But things like language and culture and, and all those things, they just don't fit the sort of innate modularity kind of idea. So again, if you had a child on a desert island, I keep coming back to that as my touchstone. Um, you can have all the innate modules you want, but you're not going to get algebra and you're not going to get a language and you're not going to get all of these things. Um, uh, we are adapted to participate in social and cultural interactions and to internalize those into our own thinking. So I don't, I just find, uh, I, I, I wouldn't, I, I don't disagree with hardly anything they do. I just think it's very narrow. Is there a sense in which, the emphases are a little bit different. I mean, the evolutionary psychology literature wants to find an adaptive explanation for all sorts of different behaviors, whereas you're more about a single big thing out of which many uh, other things are flowing. Uh, again, an, an, a very interesting and important question. Um, um, if you have to think about complicated human complicated species like apes and humans you have to think about them as organized cognitively hierarchically so i'm positing that at some point humans needed to collaborate with one another to get their food what do you have to do to be a good collaborator oh and sorry it's important that um also there's partner choice that is mm -hmm. uh, partners choose who to collaborate with mm -hmm. right so what do i have to do to be a good collaborator well, I could talk about that for about an hour, right? <laughs> so I have to have certain cognitive capacities. I have to have certain communicative capacities because I'm going to coordinate with my partner. I have to have certain moral capacities because I'm going to share the spoils. When I really want to take it all myself, I'm going to share the spoils. Um, I have to have all kinds of things for this uh, evolved, uh, for this uh, task uh, that I that is that is directing my evolution that is that is selecting me uh, and including the social part. So I have to be concerned about my reputation. I have to be mm -hmm. concerned about how other people view me as a cooperator. That means taking their perspective. Uh, so all of these things, um, I I'm sure you could get down to somewhere where you could call one of them an innate module. Okay, but. <laughs> But they're part of a larger organizational thing. Yeah, the okay. Tubian Cosmetes like to zero in on the more um, on the more uh, um, things lower on the hierarchy. That is on the on the on the, um, the on the communication I might do, or on the negotiation I might do to share the spoils, or something like that. But if you you need to, so when you say I'm looking for the one big thing, I just think that you you know. Humans are like great apes in so many ways. I don't think that in that last million years that um, that we have separate adaptations for forming social institutions, another inf uh, inf adaptation for language, another adaptation for theory of mind, another adaptation for mathematics, another adaptation. Right? I, I think it's more plausible in, in if 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 the time frame you're talking about is just a million years or even two, um, is that. Uh, we had this, yes, one of the things that Tubi and Cosmetes stressed that um, was really important in psychology and that I promote every chance I get, people will say things like, um, people who are not very evolutionarily minded, um, a psychologist, a lot of psychologists included, will say things like, um, humans evolved to be smarter and to have bigger brains. And Tubi and Cosmetes argue really forcefully and really convincingly that evolution doesn't work like that. You have to have a specific problem, right? Right. Yep. You have to have a specific problem. And so they focus on very concrete problems, mate choice or whatever it might be. Uh, and what I want to say is uh, you have to think about human behavior as hierarchical. And if what's being, what's being, I want to say what's being, I'm, ag I'm agreeing with them and I learn from them. We have a problem. And the problem is, collaborating to get food. It's just that that problem has about 50 sub problems <laughs> <laughs> that it brings with it. Um, and, uh, and they are both cognitive problems, communicative problems, socio moral problems, uh, uh, all kinds of things that go with it. So, so I wouldn't, um, uh, I, I would, I would stress that it's not that they have, a lot of little things and I have one big thing. I have one big thing that I think organizes a lot of right. little things.
Okay, that that makes a lot of sense, and and I I like the point that we're not the evolutionary pressure is not to make our brains bigger. If anything, it's the other way around. Big brains are very expensive, so there has to be some benefit of having them, and the benefit should be specific, not that someday we'll have podcasts. And in addition, another you know I know I know that a lot of people you know you seem to be a more broad minded physicist than uh, than most, <laughs> but I know a lot of people who are more in the physical sciences and. And hardcore, you know, the psychology stuff and theory minus stuff, it all seems very, you know, airy and everything. Um, um, but another concrete thing you can point to um, is, uh, is um, uh, how much longer humans' ontogeny is mm -hmm. than other apes. So great apes, uh, as soon as they wean at about age three or four, they're on their own, right? And, and they're getting their food on their own. And uh, nobody's teaching them anything, right? So there's no teaching. So they're they're basically independent agents on their own. Humans, uh, there are studies with hunter gatherer groups that 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 youngsters don't bring in more calories than they consume until they're 16 years old or something. And in the modern world, it's longer than know, that now. <laughs> yeah, our kids still have the credit card, you know, in their mid 20s. Uh, have the parents' credit card in the mid 20s. So so they are de human. This long dependency. Uh, has a lot of – you were saying the big brain has a lot of costs. It must be doing something. This long dependency is both dangerous for children. They're not able to defend themselves from predators or feed themselves for m over a decade. Uh, and it's costly for the parents because the parents are investing in the kids when they could be doing something you know, uh, more directly productive for themselves. They're, and when I watched chimps in Africa, I went – I just did a month of field work um, one time, but um, uh, uh, if a predator is nearby, moms are typically have two youngsters hanging off of them. And when you're scrambling, having two youngsters hanging <laughs> off of you and trying to get away from a leopard, that's not good. So, um, uh, so this long ontogeny is costly and risky. So it must be doing something. Right. And what it's doing is it's giving time to learn. And, and, uh, and, and to socially coordinate and to become a member of a culture. And uh, uh, I mean, I don't know if you've ever had Rob Boyd or Joe Henrik or one of those guys. Joe Henrik uh, was on the show. Yeah. Yeah. So they would, you know, they would stress that, um, uh, you know, humans have spread out. The other great apes mostly live in the tropics and humans can live in, you know, in the Arctic and uh, everywhere else. And it's because, but but you couldn't do it yourself. If they if somebody dropped you or me in the Arctic, uh, you know, we'd last uh, twenty minutes. Uh, <laughs> so, or if they dropped us in the middle of the jungle, uh, all right. So uh, the people can live in these places because they accumulate knowledge and information about these lo these specific locations and transmit it culturally uh, over time. So the long ontogeny is clearly uh, a. Uh, built on the fact that the in, that youngsters need a long time to learn stuff and they need to be protected by their parents for a long time to get that done very costly so it must so so again that that that's a concrete thing you can point to in physical development as it were uh, um, that is suggestive of a different kind of psychological um, orientation. And you mentioned morality a couple of times, and I know that uh, you have a, a whole other book on the origin of morality, and, mm. and I'm going to guess that it fits in very well with this sort of uh, social skill development story. Yes. Yeah, well, um, um, so um, all the way back to Darwin, people have recognized that being cooperative, being nice to others, altruistic um, uh, is a problem for Darwin's theory. Uh, there's, a, there's a famous uh, quip that... Um, that in, in evolutionary biology, the, def, uh, the definition of altruism is that which cannot evolve, <laughs> right? Uh, but because, because the individual – You're sacrificing, if, yeah. If, if I give away – if I want to be a really nice guy and give away all the food and all the resources that I gather, then I'm not going to be leaving any children. So I'm not going to be contributing to the future gene pool. So, every, so Darwin got it right. Everybody, all the individuals have to be looking out for themselves. But – Cooperation can be a win-win situation, which uh, there are a lot of people that don't understand this. <laughs> uh, uh, there are a lot of people who think it's a zero-sum game, but there are, there's another minority voice that's been in, in evolutionary uh, theory for all along um, that cooperation can be a win-win situation. And um, morality um, is 
I define as the as the human version of cooperation. It's a special version of cooper. It, it's a it's a psychology built for cooperation, right? Because I'm I'm sacrificing for you. I'm being fair and dividing the resources to include you and have your concerns equal to my concerns and those kinds of things. But to make it work, it has to be um, it has to um, it, it has to not disadvantage the individual out of existence. That's mm-hmm. the that's the key. And so morality is the balancing act between me keeping my concerns in mind enough to survive and keeping your um, uh, concerns in mind. Uh, and the key concept. So this is um, uh, for people who are hardcore evolutionists, this is the key concept. The key concept is interdependence. All right. And um, one way you can think about it is um, symbiosis, right? You have symbiotic, you you know about, you know, symbiotic relationships between two species. Both of them are getting something out of it, right? right? So uh, that's the whole definition of it. Well, in evolutionary biology, symbiosis is used between species. I'm not sure why it's restricted that way. I just want to generalize it within the species. That is, I can do stuff for you that you need and you do stuff for me that I need. And if the cost, you can do, you can calculate the costs and benefits so that, so that it, we, uh, let's say I do, all right, here, here, here was an example that I used to really dramatize it. Let's say that, um, that, um, um, uh, there, there's a female is the only individual. There's one female and she's the only female in the group that will mate with me. Okay. okay? My mating success is 100% <laughs> dependent on her. Now we approach some food together. What is in my long, my long-term genetic fitness interest to steal all the food and not let her get any? No. no. <laughs> Cause if she dies, then I'm, my genes are not going. So because I'm dependent on her, then I need to share with her, I need to look out for her thing. If I have a, a partner in collaborative foraging, that's my best partner. We work well together. We're successful. Everybody else is kind of a loser. That somehow I, I don't get along with them or whatever. And now my partner is sick one night. Well, you know, if I want to be successful hunting the rest of the week, maybe I better get him some chicken soup or yeah. something. I better help him out. Right? So when you're interdependent, if you look at all the, if you if you go on Google Scholar and 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 put in evolution of cooperation, all the, all of the top hits are all on uh, um, computational models of cooperation. Mm. And the computational models all ha- assume these kind of independent modules, everybody looking out for their own interests. And, and then the only way you can get cooperation to work is if you find other cooperators and all kinds of you know, green beards and all this. <laughs> uh, but if you assume that they're living in an interdependent social network where they depend on one another, then they're helping one another because they depend one another. And there's this very simple mathematics to it. Um, a, guy, um, a guy named Gilbert Roberts uh, again, I don't know exactly your background, but do, do you know the um, uh, Hamilton Ken selection? So again, I do, but let's not assume that the audience does. Okay, so the so the the, um, uh, the Ken selection is that you know my children share my genes and my brother shares my genes, and so it's in my interest for my genetic fitness that I help my uh, that I help them to a certain degree. Now, it wouldn't do for me to help them and die doing it uh, <laughs> because then I'm not going to have future children and all that. So there's a mathematics to uh, when it's in my long-term genetic interest um, to help those people. That I think Hamilton had a quip one time about um, I'd fall on a hand grenade for uh, two brothers, right. uh, four cousins or <laughs> whatever it is he's calculating. It. Well, the interdependence has exactly the same formula, but you just substitute for it. Uh, interdependence instead of uh, instead of um, re- genetic relatedness. So to the degree that I am dependent on you, I will help you. Hmm. If if my if in this in the example I gave where I have a female, the only one who will mate with me, uh, I'm 100 dependent on her for my genetic fitness. Then I'm guessing I need to share a whole lot of that food with her and somebody who's just my grooming partner. And, you know, I can live with a few more fleas. It's mm. not a big deal. I depend on them for grooming, but grooming's not a big deal. You know, maybe I don't share with them. Maybe I share a little bit with them, whatever. Uh, and, and of course, it's actually more complicated than that because all the individuals in my group, I, you know, somebody might, might be my coalition partner and my grooming partner. So, 
I think that most people um, who see cooperation as still highly problematic have not quite comprehended this process of interdependence. They think of, of individuals as all competing with one another all the time. And that's not wrong. It's just not uh, of course, there's a level at which that's true. I, I, I started the whole thing by saying you can't, you know, be altruistic to to the point that that you that you sacrifice your own existence. Uh, uh, but there is a mathematics uh, of of how much I should help people that I'm dependent on. All right, and so the book on morality starts with interdependence. That if you have interdependent um, uh, social, if you have a social group where, pe- where individuals are interdependent and almost by definition, individuals in a social group are interdependent on one another. I mean, why are they in a social group to start with? The textbook explanation is protection from predation. If you're in a group, you know, we, we were better off together. So everybody's interdependent to a little bit. If my, so if my, if my social group goes away and dies uh, on my own, I'm going to be in trouble if I'm a mammal, <laughs> for example. So I have an interest in keeping everybody alive a little bit. Yeah. Okay? But then there's some individuals that I really depend on for whatever, for mating, for cooperation, for grooming, whatever it is. Right? And, and so um, uh, we start with that kind of um, interdependence, but then some species are more, have more interdependencies than others. And so nothing is more important than getting food i mean food and mating right those are the those are the uh, the 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 key elements in in evolution um uh but food you've got to do it every every few hours every day <laughs> you're, you're if you look at chimps in the wild they're wandering around foraging for food that's what they do all day and maybe they mate on the side and they have a fight on the side and they groom on the side but where they go and what they do is all aimed at getting food and 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 primates in particular a lot of them uh, and great apes they eat fruits and the fruits only give you energy for a few hours and then you got to eat some more so um uh so if humans became interdependent with one another in getting food to a degree that other primates did not and this becomes immediate and 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 urgent interdependence I'm ready to go out and get some food. The only kind I can get is one where I can get collaboratively uh, or the only good kind, certainly the only meat. uh, And nobody will collaborate with me. (laughs) Okay. What am I going to do? Why won't they collaborate with me? Because I don't share at the end. All right. If we get something, I grab it all myself and I don't let them have any. So everybody selects against me. They don't choose me as a partner and I'm a goner. So that's the context for the evolution of morality is this interdependence cooperation, not cooperation out of just being nice, but this interdependent cooperation where we have to treat one another fairly. We have to treat one another with respect in the sense that I know that you don't have to cooperate with me. You have some other choices, right? And not only that, but I know that you need me too, to some degree. Maybe you have some other choices also, but I know if we're good partners, you depend on me and I depend on you. So I have a little leverage here too. So what's the solution? The solution is, well, okay, let's divide it equally. Let's be fair about it. So um, so I do think that um, in, in the book on morality, I, I distinguish, uh, the, it goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks, the morality of, uh, of um, uh, 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 sharing and helping and sympathy and the morality of fairness, which is a more cognitive, mm-hmm. rational kind of process. The morality of sympathy, that's where Franz de Waal has focused most of his attention. And that, I believe, is all mammals have some of it. They have their oxytocin and and, and, and their um, the mothers are sacrificing for offspring all the time. Right. And 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 some species generalize it. You may have seen some of the stuff about rats helping other rats escape from cages and stuff. So they all they already have the mechanism for uh, for sacrificing for their offspring. And that's probably evolved with genetic uh, out of out of kin selection. Uh, But then they just have to generalize the mechanism to non kin. And and. uh, so I think actually the the sort of helping and sympathy is widespread in mammals. It's just a matter of how widely do they use it. But the uh, morality of fairness and obligation, 
I have an obligation. You know, you sh you helped me last time. I have an obligation to help you this time. We worked equally hard at this foraging problem, so I feel an obligation to share equally that we do it fairly and equally. So that that's a motivator. This sense of obligation is not the same thing as being nice. Uh, you know, it, it's it's something a little bit more. Ra and I think that is what comes from collaborative foraging. You know, I did very recently uh, a related podcast topic with Adam Bully. I don't know if you know him. He's a younger guy. Uh, but he's written a book recently with Thomas Sudendorf and Jonathan Redshaw called The Invention of Tomorrow. Oh, yes. Uh, well, I know uh, the um, um, Sudendorf uh, is the one who's been on that, uh, yeah. singing that song for a couple of decades. So I know the Sudendorf stuff. I, I haven't read the, that particular book. Yeah, but the idea that uh, one of the things that really separates human beings from other species is mental time travel, right? The ability to put ourselves in the future. I really kind of like that perspective. It might be the physicist in me talking and my interest in yeah. time. But, but everything that you just said about morality – uh, takes that into account in the sense that you're saying, well, if I don't do this thing right now, the future is going to yes. come back to Good. haunt me. And, and you can conceptualize that, right? And we can conceptualize that in a way that other animals maybe cannot. Yeah, no, that's a, I, absolutely true. And and uh, um, uh, that's an important part of the process. The um, There are studies with apes where they do a little bit of planning, future planning, mm -hmm. uh, and they do a little bit of episodic memory uh, it's not nearly to the same extent as humans. Um, my initial tendency would be to say it probably somehow is part of this story of relating to others and uh, that kind of thing. But I, I don't have a particular story for exactly how that works. Sure. But it does uh, lead us exactly into sort of the capstone of the conversation, which is the idea of agency, yeah. uh, which is the focus of your most recent book. You should tell us the title of your most recent book. Uh, the evolution of agency, there you go. Uh, and I think it says behavioral organization from lizards to humans. <laughs> I can never remember my subtitles because they always change in the production process. So I, I usually... wanted to get lizards in there or something like that <laughs> because um, I wanted I wanted to convey to people who know my other books that I'm going a little bit farther yeah. back in evolution than I have previously. So, what do you mean by agency in this context? Okay, so. <clears throat> um, let me let me just give you an, start with an example that's on page one of the book. Um, so, squirrels cache nuts, right? They 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 hide them away and store and store them for winter and go get them later. That's clearly an evolved behavior. They that that all squirrels do it the world over. This is part of squirrel evolved psychology. But if you look at a particular squirrel at a particular moment with a nut, and he's trying to decide where to cache it in this landscape. I'm saying that evolution cannot, in principle, tell them what to do. It, it's, it can't be determined like that. And so in general, what evolution has done, and it may be that, uh, that you can think of these very simple creatures, one-celled organisms and very simple creatures. It may be that you can think of them in deterministic way. I don't know. I, but but the creatures um, that are a little more complicated – what nature has done is said, okay, I'm going to build you in with a lot of stuff here. But then when it comes down to actually making a decision about what to do in a particular situation, I'm going to leave it up to you because I can't predict. I don't know exactly where the watering <laughs> hole is in the place you're born. Nature doesn't know that ahead of time. The watering holes change. So I'm going to build you with the capacity to learn where water your watering hole is and to decide when and how to go there and stuff like that. So, um, so agency is about um, the um, agency evolves when um, there are unpredictabilities and nature builds in an apparatus for the individual to deal with those unpredictabilities through what I call informed decision making. That is looking around, gathering information and making the best decision. That decision is – on a particular occasion, is not determined by Mother Nature. Uh, what's determined is the decision-making apparatus that you go to it with. And so, but so you need an agent. Now, a lot of people say, oh gosh, that sounds like a homunculus to me, right? <laughs> that somehow, uh, but this is why in that book, I start out with control systems. 
right? So I think that, um, and this goes back to the cybernetics, to Ross Ashby and, and Norbert Wiener and people like that. Mm -hmm. they, they build these machines and do this theory uh, showing that if you, have, if you have a problem where you need a machine that can act autonomously from, in, from individuals, from humans, um, and intelligently, it has only one possible structure. And that is, it has to perceive the world. It has to have a goal state that it wants to be the case in the environment. It has to perceive the environment and see if it matches with the goal state. And if it doesn't, it has to be able to do something to make it, so to make it match. So, you 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 know, the, the classic is the thermostat, right? Uh, right? So, if I want the room cooler, I can go get a fan and turn on the fan. But the fan is dumb because I just turn it on or off and I'm the one who decides if it needs to be cool or not and what to do and all that. But the thermostat, it has a thermometer. It senses the temperature, right? It has a set goal. I set the goal. I put it at 72 degrees, but it has that goal and it senses the temperature of the room and it sees if they match. And if it doesn't, then it acts to make it match. Um, my, I, I was explaining some of this to my 11-year-old daughter uh, a couple of weeks ago and we were at a we were at a, um, a stoplight and she said, that stoplight is a dumb machine, isn't it? <laughs> and I said, it is it because is. it turns on and off at a, on a timing. And I asked her, my 11 year old, I asked her, how would you make the, the, uh, the traffic light more uh, intelligent? And she said, well, it would have to, it would have to have a camera that saw where the cars were and then some algorithm or something that turns green where there's the longest line and turn, right? It's pretty good. So, so what I want to argue is that um, nature invented this it, homeostasis in the body is the same thing, right? The, the homeostatic mechanisms that you have a blood temperature, a temperature body temperature, and and that's a, a set point. And when you get too cold or too hot, your body does things. Right? It the same model works in um, behavior, um, and. Uh, uh, Again, I want to say that it's not a homunculus, which some people, the more deterministic minded people tend to worry about that. I make an analogy to um, 20, early 20th century biology. Okay. There was a big debate between people who were vitalists right. and, and mechanists. And the vitalists said, okay, living things have a vital substance that makes them different. Right. And that's a kind of a homunculus, if you will. OK. A vital. And it turns out that's not true. It turns out living things are made out of the same stuff as <laughs> everything else, but it's organized in a different way. So I want to say that there's nothing like a homunculus that control systems show you the a, a certain kind of organization that the organism has in relation to its environment, that their their behavioral decision making is organized in a certain way. Um, and that's what we want to call um, an agent. The agent is the organism acting with this kind of uh, cognitive organization that I gather in. You know, I have a goal. I gather information. I decide what needs to be due to meet to meet the goal, uh, and so forth. So, um, so that's what the agency is. It's it's about the and, and I would say that people who um, uh, who want to say that everything is deterministic in, in the world, you know, the La, Laplacian uh, the, the starting state and everything is determined. They just don't want psychology in the picture. I want to say that if you want psychology in the picture, you have to have an individual making decisions. And if you don't, then it's fine, but it's all physics or it's all biology. And I'm a psychologist and I want psychology. And the psychology means I have an individual who's assessing the situation and deciding what to do uh, to, to meet its goals. So um, people kind of, that's, I don't think, I mean, it is controversial to some people, but I would say most psychology kind of operates with that as a kind of an assumption. But in the field of animal behavior, and I actually wrote the book on agency for people in animal behavior, mm -hmm. there's still a lot of kind of um, behavioristic talk, like stimulus and response. The mm -hmm. organism is responding to a stimulus. Well, that's a kind of a classic physicalistic cause leads to effect. Stimulus leads to response. I want to say, no, the organism has a goal it's pursuing. And, and when it perceives something that you're calling a stimulus, they're seeing that it doesn't match their goal. 
And so they're acting to do, right? So you, you need to think of a, a circular causality of the cybernetic type, of the control system type. And even in a case where, so there may be things like reflexes, right? So a, a, a small object comes toward my eye and I blink. Okay, I'm willing to give you that for stimulus response, all right? Uh, but, um, but anything that's, you know, that we, that we think of as um, intelligent autonomous behavior, what defines it is a certain organization. And I, I want to call it agentive organization, mm -hmm. control system organization. And what I do in the book is step through different kinds of control system organization. The key variable being how much executive control do you have? So very simple organisms are simple control systems. But then when you get to things like mammals, they've got an executive control system that can plan ahead, uh, uh, that can consider different possibilities before acting, and that can get feedback from its uh, actions and, and learn and adjust and so forth. All right. And then where I get to my my work um, that we talked about for most of our podcast here, the shared intentionality is that humans have evolved to be shared agents or social agents or plural agents. All these are words different people have used. And when you and I decide to solve a problem, when you and I are going hunting together collaboratively, we have a shared goal. We have a joint goal. We have shared knowledge about the situation and we communicate to make sure we have shared knowledge. Um, and, uh, um, and we, we kind of self-regulate it together. So I say, hey, hey, go over there and don't do this. You say, oh, don't do that, do this, you know? And so we're kind of regulating it. So we kind of make a shared agent. And I've used the word shared intentionality in most of my uh, work until recently. And it, it's the same thing, but shared agency is the behavioral side, the actual collaborative to solve a problem. And shared intentionality is the kind of underlying cognitive capacities that allow the, the shared agency to work. Um, but anyway, so that's what the idea for the book was. I've always had this control system view all the way back to my earliest stuff. I've never really elaborated it. And so I wanted to elaborate the control system view in the context of the sort of arguing that psychology is important in evolution because uh, or, organisms making decisions. And, um, and then I can scale that all the way up to humans by talking about shared agency. Uh, and by the way, Darwin... Uh, uses the word agency. He actually uh, says that the agency of organisms is a factor in their evolution because mm. um, I give an example in the book where let's say uh, I'm a lizard or something and I usually get insects on the ground and all of a sudden something wipes all those out and they don't exist anymore. And now the only insects are the ones that are up in the trees. And some lizards are capable of climbing the tree and getting the, the getting the new insects and others aren't. So those are the ones that survive. So and and they have uh, made a choice to go up the tree and capture these guys. Other guys have not. And so their actual behavior um, um, is leading the way. So now, for example, those guys may grow longer claws. So this is what people sometimes are called genetic assimilation. So now the genes follow the behavior. Mm. Now I need to be a tree climber where I didn't before. So now long claws are an advantage. So this is, again, that hierarchical system. If I'm going to be chasing insects in trees, I need to grow long claws, which I wouldn't if I didn't go up the tree. So behavior and agency can be a leading edge in, um, in the evolutionary process itself. So that's another dimension of it. Well, the, the different levels is, is an interesting idea because when you started in the book, when you started the squirrel example, I thought you were going to put squirrels on the non-agentive side of things <laughs> but, and human beings on the agentive side. But you're saying that in a sense, a squirrel is an agent, has to figure out where to put its cache of nuts. But you couldn't sit down with the squirrel and explain, oh, no, no, this year you don't have to do that. I promise to feed you. So that, that's the kind of agency that it doesn't have. That's correct. And, and so I, I have, I, I have a, you know, this uh, typology of sort of three types of individual agency and then the shared agency that humans have. And, and, and this, this, I think, um, uh, actually um, uh, fits with this. My, from the very beginning, we started with the idea that, um, yes, uh, humans are continuous with other creatures. And, and there has been this building up of stuff over evolution that gets us to humans. Um, and humans just add this one little twist. 
I, I'm fascinated by the idea of goals and as they appear here because it, it again, and I don't have a, a strong feeling about what to say, but you know, we have an arrow of time. We remember the past and we causally influence the future. And it's always fascinating to me how, he, I don't know if it's human or it probably goes back way deeper in, in evolution, but the when was the first goal? When was the first time that we could yep. have attributed to a species or an organism the idea that there is a concept of what I'm aiming for? Uh, in the book, <laughs> uh, I, I punt on some of the – on exactly when that might happen. But I would say that single-celled organisms, bacteria, single-celled organisms and that stuff do not have – they don't – organisms without a nervous system hmm. probably don't. Mm -hmm. I'm just speculating. Probably don't. Um, and I wanted to I wanted to simplify my problem. I mean, I don't know if you know the Gottfried Smith stuff on octopi and all that, but yeah. okay, that's really they're they're off on a different world. I don't know about <laughs> them. All right, right. So, but on the line to humans, the first vertebrates uh, would have been fish. I don't. There's not a lot of research on fish, but if you now go to the first land vertebrates, they're like lizard-like creatures, and I think they clearly have goals. If you look at the if you look at research with lizards. Um, uh, they are trying to achieve goals and you put them in experimental situations and you can see that. So I don't know where the first one was, but I feel confident that from vertebrates on, uh, they mm -hmm. do. And um, um, I don't, you know, th there are these guys off to the side, like um, insects and octopus and all that sort of stuff. And I just, I'm, 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 I don't know about them. <laughs> That's fair, very fair. Uh, what are your feelings about free will? Uh, so the, the agency book basically is saying, um, uh, that you have to, um, the decision-making apparatus <laughs> is evolved. You don't have a choice about whether to have that apparatus or not, right? But given that apparatus, yes, the individual has free will to choose within that, uh, within that, um, thing. Now, I don't have a free will to choose whether to blink my eye when a small object comes toward it. So not in all of my behaviors. Um, uh, but, you know, um, 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 humans can starve themselves to death or commit suicide or whatever. So uh, um, to me, people who want to de deny free will are essentially taking um, uh, a kind of a physicist view of, uh, of psychology, Right. That somehow this this yeah. is like, you know, uh, you know, planets attracting one another, or atoms attracting one another or whatever. Uh, I'm saying, no, the world is a multifarious place and there's a, and there are creatures that are agentive that make decisions and they have evolved an apparatus uh, uh, to do it. So if you want to say it's deterministic in the sense that the apparatus for doing it is deterministic, uh, then fine. If you want to say the criteria they take into account when the. When the squirrel is deciding uh, about where to cache the nut, he probably doesn't take into account, uh, you know, the temperature or the wind direction or whatever. You know, there. So, what is relevant to the decision might possibly be uh, part of the deterministic thing. But unless you want to eliminate psychology, you need that individual making the decision, and it's not a homunculus. It's a. It's just organized as a control system. That's all. And so that's. Uh, yeah, that's. And, and I would just say also. That anyone who denies free will is just doing it as an intellectual exercise because um, they themselves, if you really didn't think people had free will, <laughs> you'd never get angry at anybody. Yeah. You'd never get angry at your wife for not doing something because, uh, well, she can't help herself, right? And, uh, and, and you yourself would never, you know uh, – uh, worry about a decision because, you know, it's all determined anyway. So I think in their everyday lives, nobody believes it. I'm pro free will myself. I did have Robert Sapolsky on the podcast and, uh, you know, he did his best to convince me that it was all a myth. But if you haven't read it or you're not familiar with it, I would recommend a book by Janan Ismail, who's a philosopher. She wrote a book called How Physics Makes Us Free. And it's, oh. it's very much in the spirit of your sort of uh, control theory way of thinking uh -huh. about things, recursion, the difficulty of fitting ourselves into our physical description of the world, you know, the practical uh -huh. difficulty. And that's what makes it hard to really in any, uh, any even semi-plausible sense to be a determinist about the, the macroscopic world of human experience. 
Yeah, so there's a book um, by um, Christian List uh, oh, yeah. called uh, Why Free Will is Real. And he basically um, is saying, like I am, that um, uh, the tendency to want to deny free will is to look at things from one perspective, from this sort of yeah. you know deterministic physical perspe- physicist perspective. But the but if you just keep your level straight, uh, you know we're on the level that we work on that 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 Robert Sapolsky works on every day when he decides what shirt to put yeah. on. <laughs> uh, uh, you know that that's um, uh, if he wants to say what shirt he puts on this morning is determined determined. Fine, but I, that he doesn't really believe that. That's just a you know. <laughs> I, I get it. Sorry. I wrote a book about that too. I, I, I'm on your side very much. Um, so maybe to, like you know to finally wrap things up. Um, leading from the different levels of agency, you have sort of a provocative thought in the book about uh, increasing complexity along this chain leads to not only different kinds of agency, but different kinds of experience, you know, different yeah. kinds of, I don't know, uh, you know, mental relationship to reality. Uh, well, that this, seems- this, is a, this is a very long and difficult uh, topic, Sean, that I'm in a, in a clear <laughs> minority on. But um, I believe if you are an evolutionist, um, you have to, you know, what is the world? Do you know von Uchtskall at all? He was a classic Anyway, uh, what is the world for a worm? Hmm. You know, what is the world for a tick? He, uh, I don't uh, know, but has, I think that's a good question. Von Uxall has a big, uh, a, a big thing about ticks because he he'd studied ticks. You know, and they and they and and they they basically just sense the temperature of the of a mammal walking by or whatever the 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 ticks. All right, so is it the case that they have their restricted little world worms only are below ground and whatever, and the ticks are only sensing temperature, but we humans have access to the the real world, the way it really is. Aren't we lucky? (laughs) (laughs) We have our world that's determined by this uh, evolutionary process, by our agentive system as well. uh, And by what things are relevant to our agentive decision-making. Um, when we make decisions, we scan the world for things that are relevant. We pay attention for things that are relevant to our decisions. And so I, I just think that, um, uh, the, you know, the general idea of an ecological niche, that's, a, that's an everyday common sense idea that animals live in different ecological niches. Fish live in water in the same forest. You know, squirrels live in the – with leaves and trees and the worms live under the ground and the – Butterflies thrive through the sky, so they live in sort of different worlds. In the even that's their ecological niche. Well, I use the term experiential niche. The experiential niche is the world as you perceive and understand it, which evolved to support your agent of actions in it. And humans, even though to even though we like to think differently, humans are the same. Yeah. Now, part of our ecolog, part of our experiential. Um, a niche is the mental world of the other people we're dealing with and the cultural world into which we're born and the normative world about the way things ought to be. You're talking about the, the mental time travel. One part of mental time travel is the way things ought to be. Yep. And so uh, no other creature, I don't think I could be wrong, but no other creature uh, you know, plans its actions and behaves with respect to what ought to be the case. Uh, so this is the human world. So um, I would just say that um, uh, it's harder to see in the case of humans and maybe a little easier to see in the case of other creatures. But I would say um, that the that organisms experience those things they need to experience uh, to get done what they need to get done. You know, I did talk to Ed Young, uh, and he had wrote a wonderful book about the different umwelt that different kinds of animals have because yes. of their sensory capacity, capacities. Yes. I, I am sad that I didn't think myself to think about the experiential umwelt and how, yeah. uh, you know, the normative versus present future, everything going yes. on. Yeah, it's a, it, there's there's layers here that it, it's very fascinating to think about. The, the worm is not living in that world. Right. I'm sorry. It's not. Okay. Now, now we say, oh, well, we're living in the real world, and the worm is living in some subset. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there's certainly animals that can sense things that we don't. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's a Thomas Nagel's famous. What is it like to be a bat? Right. 
Right, right, right. So we still don't know, but we're we're learning. I think you've helped us a lot in uh, in thinking about why we're we're slightly different. And I, okay, here's a final question: If this is the hierarchy uh, of of our evolutionary advance um, with our with our increased capacities, is there another future advance that uh, super intelligences or anything like that might might get to? Yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know about it either. I'm just <laughs> this might be over my pay grade. <laughs> I, I would say sort of um, uh, right now, the challenge for humans is um, is more on the cooperation realm. We're going to blow yeah. ourselves up or we're going to degrade the environment to the degree that we can't live in it anymore or something like that. So it's the cooperative challenge we have to meet Uh and if we can, you know, find a way to meet that uh, first, um, you know, then maybe we can do some more cognitive things. But um, um, uh, I, I will say that I, I think that, you know, once you start getting civilizations like um, take Western civilization from Mesopotamia and Egypt and then ancient Greek and all that. These were guys that were building up knowledge themselves and then and they didn't even know the other guys existed. And then they bumped into one another. And a lot of incredible stuff happened when they bumped into one another. The the Greeks get mm. math from the you know from the East, and I think I think as 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 the world if when and if the world can become more of a world community, I think that will be a big boon because this this social cultural process that I'm focusing on will get another boost. Uh, I mean, we do know a lot, there are not many secrets in the world now. I must say, with the, all the communication and whatnot, but um, but uh, but maybe if we were more integrated and scientists from different um, uh, countries were working together more, um, you know, something new might come of it. But first, we have to solve the cooperation problem and uh, and all these, um, you know, um, nationalistic people who don't want to cooperate. Yeah, you know, at the end of the podcast, we like to let our hair down and speculate a little bit. That, that's perfectly good. And you've been very uh, a good sport about that. So, Mike Tomasello, thanks very much for being on the Winescape podcast. Thank you, Sean.